I'm Spencer Hinkle, and I teach design, build, remodeling at Portland Community College. Thanks to funding from the National Science Foundation, I'd like to share a simple experiment with you. This is an experiment I've been developing in my mechanical systems for kitchens and bath class to help students better understand how conduction and convection affect human comfort and energy efficiency in the built environment and how they relate to R values, U factors, insulation and air sealing. Well, after years of watching students' eyes glaze over when I would lecture on these topics, I finally discovered this simple method, this simple little experiment to help me make it real. But before we get started, here are excerpts from a conversation that I had with building scientist Dan Cote. I'm sitting here speaking with Dan Cote, a building scientist from Portland, Oregon. And the reason I'm talking to him is because myself and my students have a hard time really getting our heads around R value and U value and all of the concepts are around heat exchange. And so I'm hoping that Dan can um, make some of these things a little bit clearer to us and our students. Would you agree, Dan, that it's important for us to uh, have a better understanding of those two concepts and just understanding that the bigger the number, the, the, the better the R value and so forth? Sure, and I think the the things that folks don't necessarily always understand are what makes a difference when you're choosing material type or um, more importantly if there's another contractor involved that's going to be sizing heating equipment or cooling equipment for the space that you're remodeling, if, especially if it's an addition or a new space, they need a better understanding of, of what type of product you're putting in and how much you're putting in so they can properly size the new equipment to serve that space and impact the comfort. Okay, so my understanding is that R value, uh, the R stands for resistance uh, of a particular material to have heat transfer through it, energy transfer through it. Um, and then U value is the reciprocal of that, is that correct? Right, and so R value essentially is, uh, for lack of a a more complex answer. It's really just designed so that la the layperson can easily understand a scale. And, and the R values are really kind of that. There's a scale that's saying, you know, if you're on the lower end of the scale, this is not as resistant to transfer of heat energy than if you're on the higher end of the scale. Right. And okay. in general, if we're trying to stop that heat transfer, whether it's the air that's in the building or the, the energy that's in the building leaving the space, or whether it's that's, that's outside and we don't want it to come into and, the space right. um, would impact um, that choice. Okay. So Dan, why, why do we need to know the difference between R value and U value? I mean, from a, from a building scientist perspective, what, what, what's the importance of that? Why is it that some materials are rated in R value and some things like windows are rated in U, in U values? Well, I think what's, what's important about it is knowing when one factor or the other has to be used for a particular purpose. So if you're just trying to maybe meet what the code official is telling you you have to have as an insulation level, and they, they say, oh, you need R21 in that wall, it's easy enough to just go pull R21 off the shelf and right. then stick it in. Um, but when you're trying to comply with code, maybe one of the things that you're going to be doing is um, potentially trying to figure out is the assembly have the overall uh, rating that you want. And so right. sometimes when you're calculating what the heat loss is across an entire assembly, which may include a door and a window and a wall and framing and things like that, you have to know the difference between um, areas of each of the different components and their particular uh, values in that assembly. So for example, if I have a a window that's rated for R2 and I have a wall that's rated at R10, I can't simply add those together and divide by two and average that out and say, oh, yeah, I have R6. R6. Yeah. That's not how it works. R values don't really have any um, units associated with them that would specify their area. So right. so, U that, value, so that that if that window was real small that may change or real big exactly how it wouldn't have a way to change with right. R values. It's right. just a number. So you have to account for that if you want to understand what that assembly is okay, really doing. Great. So 
that your heating contractor is going to be very interested in knowing how many BTUs of heat energy are going to leave that wall over the course of the heating season so that they can make sure the heating equipment can put that many BTUs into the yeah, room. To it, right. So we have to define what's going to leave that assembly. And to do that, we would convert all of the different parts to their U associated U values. And then we would apply area. U values have a series of units associated with them. And area is a main component in yeah. us understanding how much of this thing do yes. I have and how much of this thing do I have. So you, you can break those down into their U values. You can break those areas down. And then you can average that assembly and come up with one R value for the whole assembly. Um, so there's a difference between um, those things in, in R values. Although they are additive across an assembly, for example, um, if I have R10 here in my wall and I put half inch of sheetrock on it, which is R.5 approximately, that does mean that I have 10.5 across that given space. But it doesn't necessarily mean that in the entire area, the entire assembly yeah. is going to operate the same way because there's different products and different things sure. in that assembly. Sure. Yeah, because you'd have right next door to that, you'd have a stud. If it was a three and a half inch stud, you'd have R three and a half. You'd have the drywall, which is 0.5. Right. You could add those up, but they're going to be significantly less than the insulated space. Right. And again, you couldn't add all those things up and then try and come up with some average for the whole assembly, right? Because you haven't actually thought about what, what's the area of all the wood and the area of all the sheetrock and the area of all the insulation and sheathing and all those things. So we typically break it all down, convert everything to you. At, it, at, at now we can we can use that area component because that's one of the units of U value. Okay. And then we can put it all back together and say, oh well, by putting in this window and by framing the wall just this way, we put R21 in the base, but it really our wall performs like R17 because we've got some things that are not so good in there or not as good as the insulation sure. we used. And and so, if we have a, a let's say we have a two-story home with a, a basement, first story, second story. There's also a pressure. Diff pressure is sort of a part of this whole picture as well, isn't it? Right, so the, the pressure inside of, of a building, if you've ever been in a, in a house where you uh, tried to open a bedroom door maybe and you could tell that that door wanted to push back on your, yeah, yeah. On your face and close, maybe not really hard, but you, you, you felt that. That's, an air, that's air pressure in action. In that particular case, it's probably the air conditioning uh, system is running and it's pumping that room up full of air and that room's trying to get out that doorway when you mm -hmm. open it and exactly. it ends up pushing the door back closed. With um, the, the type of heat loss or heat gain um, convective in things that we're talking about, what we have is a difference in temperature between the indoors and outdoors that drives that uh, change. So okay. when we have, um, let's say it's 20 degrees outside, and we're keeping the building at 70 degrees. Think of that building like a hot air balloon. We're, we're pumping it up with warm air. Exactly. And so what's it want to do? It wants to blow up. Well, we build buildings pretty sturdy and pretty strong, uh, so we don't see the building materials blow up like a right. balloon, but every crack, leak, hole in that building is under pressure. And so that air's forced out those openings. Right. So if you have an electrical outlet in the wall, there's a crack around that electrical outlet where air is being forced through into that wall cavity through your insulation and out a hole, a hole somewhere in the a, building. That a plumber right. or, or, or an electrician, or, an electrician or, or a cable guy or a homeowner yep. or somebody yep. either drilled or, or, or maybe it's just a seam between two building materials that yeah. was never sealed. Sealed properly. Right. So okay. anything like that needs to be sealed or when you have that pressure difference, which is most of the time, even, even on mild days where let's say it's 60 outside and 70 inside, as long as there's a difference in temperature, you're going to have a pressure change. Right. So the only time you aren't going to have that pressure change is when it's the exact same, same temperature, temperature inside, inside and, and out. out. Right. And you're usually not right. running your, your <laughs> heating and cooling system when that's the case. And that's the case, exactly. So you don't, you don't, you're not worried about that's losing great. or gaining energy, unwanted energy. Yeah. Warm air rises and therefore there's heat in that warm air and so the heat mm -hmm. is rising. Right. But really what, that, what we're saying when we say that is we mean that warm air is rising, and we call that the stack effect. Right. Just because warm air will rise does not mean that we aren't still going to lose heat energy through those walls and through those windows and through those studs and all those other things right. through our floor systems 
anywhere that we have a temperature difference across the assembly, you're still going to have conductive heat loss. Right. So um, a lot of times you'll hear people say, well, we put more insulation in the attic because heat rises. That's absolutely not true. We put more insulation in the attic because there's more space the up there. <laughs> we have more space in there. I mean, yeah. If we could build walls that were as tall as our attics, we'd put more insulation in our walls too. Sure. Um, but we just don't have space in our walls to practically do that. Now, when we get into um, super insulated homes and you'll see strategies to make the walls really big, and that's um, one method. But in all, for all practical purposes, most construction projects are not going to go that route. They're right. going to you know, pick the standard two by six or two by four exactly. type framing, and they're gonna stay within those parameters. So what we're wanting to make sure that everyone understands is clear is that you've got more than one type of heat loss you're battling. You have convective heat loss, and that is warm air rising in the yes. heating climates, right. and it's also cold air sinking in the cooling climates and bringing in hot air, hot from, air above, from above. Right? So the stack effect essentially works in the reverse mm -hmm. in our summer summertime climates hey, in uh, North America. I was thinking about how during a on a really hot summer day the smell of the attic is in the second is in floor. The second yeah, floor. You, yeah and sure. Because it's all of that heat is coming down. Right. It's being drawn in yeah, being especially drawn if in. you're cooling and you have a leaky house. Right. That cold air that you're gener generating by running your cooling system um, is sinking to the bottom of the building and uh, you're drawing in that energy, right, uh, right. that heat energy from your attic space, and it happens to pick up the smell of your roof and all that good stuff <laughs> and bring it with it. Um, so yeah, certainly is, is, is a factor. Um, but it, it's not to, to um, dismiss that we are doing two different things. When we insulate, we're really dealing with conductive losses. Right. And when we air tighten a building, we're dealing with the convective losses. Okay. And they're two very different things. There's only a few insulations out there that actually do both. So if you have a spray-in type insulation, something that's, that's going to stick to it and cure, like a, a foam type application, that, if it's done right and if it's done to the specifications it's supposed to be done to, right. can create an airtight assembly. Um, some of the dense pack insulation materials out there, both the uh, cellulose and fiberglass type insulation materials, some of those are also designed to dra dramatically reduce air movement through them by packing to a proper density. Not all of them, so you really have to make sure you're looking at the right, the product, right product when you yeah. do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we can manually air seal. We can go in with foam guns and caulking guns and we can seal everything up by hand and then insulate with a standard material as well. Right. So there's a variety of ways to do it. It depends on the cost, um, what, what yeah. type of resources you have on your job site. Um, but you can use any insulation material you want as long as you also make sure that you, you do the air sealing necessary if it doesn't bring that component right. with it. So air sealing is really the, the low hanging fruit and when it comes to sealing a house up. An, an older home that, that doesn't have, you know, the, the greatest insulation uh, in the walls and so forth, if we can just stop the air movement, right. that's going to dramatically change the comfort inside the home. Right. Uh, kitchen designers love can lights. Mm. <laughs> and um, that's probably one of the major uh, issues with with heat loss, right? You got going out through uh, those cans, right? Especially when those can lights are in an attic assembly, where yes. where we have um, a lack of way to properly tighten that assembly. They're like miniature chimneys, essentially, where they're creating a lot of heat right at them because they're a heat source. Right. They're light bulbs, and so all that heat is wanting to. Uh, rise right up, that won't work. It's warming the air, it's rising right it's up, and that air is being replaced by air in your kitchen. And that air in your kitchen is being replaced by <laughs> air from outdoors somewhere. Right. So you're creating a little chimney of, of heat loss. And when you don't have a, a, an attic above them, it doesn't mean you're scot free. So you still have access to the outdoors exactly through, through the building cavities if they haven't been well sealed, sure. which in old homes they usually haven't been well sealed. Right, right. So you're still forcing that energy out, maybe not as quickly, but you're still going to have that pathway. So with, with recessed cans, um, you really have to make sure that you're using an airtight can that's rated for insulation contact and that the airtight components of the can are actually installed. Yeah. A lot of times the gaskets and things um, they're not well understood. They look just like flimsy little silly things right. and they're thrown out instead of installed. So the, the process 
of making sure all those things go in um, 